Broadcasting live from Detroit, Michigan, and all around the world, the Church Militant is Mike. Here's your host, Michael Morris. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Miked Up, coming to you from Detroit, Ferndale. Nice, warm summer day. Finally, finally, the warmth has come here. Now, the very first thing we want to say in relation to our expansion campaign is thank you very much. If those of you may not have seen today's Vortex may know that uh, uh, last week we asked for your help for $50,000 to help expand this studio we're in upgrade some of the equipment, hire some new people, a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of things going on. Uh, just tons of things are going to be going on around here for the next month or so. And you responded in spades. It's humbling, exciting, wonderful. So we just want to say thank you. We far exceeded our requests of $50,000. So uh, to St. Michael, to our Blessed Mother, of course, much gratitude. And to you as well for uh, you know trusting us uh, and you know sort of giving us the big boy for what we do here. We, we do it all together for the glorification of the church. So uh, moving on now, and speaking of the glorification of the church, uh, we cover, as you know, from time to time, uh, some controversial uh, things going on in the church, one of them being the absolute meltdown of the Church of Nice. Now, we know lots of people in the Church of Nice, the Establishment Church, don't like that expression, but it is a very true expression because it represents exactly what's going on. But there is this dark side to the Church of Nice, and uh, we sort of call it the Church of Ugly. And we're seeing an example of that right now in the Archdiocese of New York. Now, uh, we did a vortex last week showing some of the major parish shutdowns in various big archdioceses all over the country, and it's it's astounding. Even here in Detroit, we had this, uh, uh, the Archbishop of Detroit, Alan Vigneron, a couple of weeks ago held a press conference, and in this press conference, uh, he admitted that, uh, you know, there was this massive meltdown, a 50% reduction in the sacramental life here in the Archdiocese of Detroit uh, over the space of just 13 years, a 50% reduction. I mean, that's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. So we went on to talk about uh, how that, uh, how the meltdown of the establishment church is happening all over the United States. One of the places we talked about was the Archdiocese of New York. And New York, now the list hasn't been finalized in the sense of made public yet, but the Archdiocese of Detroit, from everything we can gather from inside uh, sources in the uh, uh, in the New York Archdiocese, is, is that they are just about ready to come public with closing somewhere between 50 and 70 parishes, just shutting them down. And the problem with this is, how do you determine which ones? Can some politics enter in? How about some particular uh, ways of uh, wanting to squelch some enemies, if you consider them enemies. Sure, all this stuff enters into it. Of course it does. And the big problem is that there is one particular church in New York, in Manhattan, and that church in Manhattan is Holy Innocence. Now, Holy Innocence has, uh, uh, it's sort of right in the heart of Manhattan, has been a very well-known church for a number of years now because it has been sort of uh, the mainstay of the traditional Latin Mass community. It really is the only uh, church uh, that, well, St. Agnes is over by uh, Grand Central has uh, traditional Latin Mass also. My parents, God rest my mother, uh, used to go to that Mass. But uh, Holy Innocence is a tremendous church. It's got a wonderful faithful faith community there, uh, very, very dedicated to the church's traditional teachings, traditional Latin Mass, everything you could name. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, it becomes known that Holy Innocence is right at the top or near the top of the parish hit list of all the parishes, of all the parishes that you would want to, want to target to close. Why on earth would a parish that has a faithful community there that had raised money to upgrade and, and redecorate, I and mean, it was a pretty expensive drive, too. They, I mean, they did all sorts of things. When not too very far down the road at St. Francis Xavier uh, Church, we're going to show you a picture here. What goes on there? It's a celebration of the homosexual lifestyle, the nonstop celebration of the homosexual lifestyle. There, you're seeing a picture here of the, uh, the, a runner, a gay flag runner, uh, going right into the sanctuary. And is that church being targeted? Oh, no, 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 no. Some things are just, you know, too sacrosanct. We can't do that. Um, but, yeah, Holy Innocence Church, as you can see here, this next picture we have up, um, you know, this gets targeted. And there are vocations coming out of there. There are all kinds of—it is a vibrant, 
small but vibrant and growing Catholic community. Why on earth would Cardinal Dolan, or himself or his the people he's appointed, put a church like this on the front of it? Well, on the front of their hit list, the top of their list. Well, this came out, and uh, the uh, priest there, Father Wiley, uh, gave a homily, and this homily has become the subject of a firestorm on the Internet. And uh, he essentially said, stand fast, you know, faithful, traditional Catholics, stand fast. Uh, you know, this is a cross you're going to have to carry, etc., like that. But you need to, you know, what happens to you? And he raised all these questions that, uh, that many, uh, many traditional-minded Catholics, faithful Catholics, have been asking for years. Why is it that they're always the ones targeted? And you got to remember this, folks, again. When you're putting together a list, the cardinal gets to pick this parish closes, this parish stays open, these parishes cluster. Why would you leave untouched a number of parishes that are openly celebrating of the homosexual lifestyle, uh, you know, flying under the cover of LGBT ministries, we all know what that means, and just put the clamps on a parish uh, that wants to promote traditional Catholicism? Uh, it's a big question, and it was a question that Father Wiley raised in his homily uh, last week, a couple weeks ago, and he has been sent packing so much for the church of nice and tolerance and non-judgmentalism, huh? Well, standing by with us right now is a friend of Father Wiley's, Father Paul, or sorry, Paul Greger, friend of Father uh, Father Wiley's. Paul, how are you? I'm fine. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah, let me ask you that question. Do you think that there is this? I don't know if you say it's targeting or. Uh, but why is it that, you know, at the end of the day, it's always the small little faithful traditional Latin mass Catholics that are always the left ones holding the bag and getting the pink slip? <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to say how honored I am actually to be referred to as a friend of Father Wiley. It is a great honor to be his friend. And I was in the Church of Holy Innocence um, at the Sunday Mass when he pronounced that homily, and I was quite, I was quite horrified actually when I heard of the reprisals that he'd suffered um, but really, I, I began to wonder, what planet do these people in the archdiocese live on? You know, if I were more blessed with the theological virtue of charity, I, I may, may even be tempted to feel sorry for them. <laughs> you know, they talk about wanting to make all things new, and they want to make sure that the church gets with the times. But, you know, hello, you know, wake up and smell the incense. If in today's world you try to silence one voice, Thousands will echo that voice over the internet. Yeah, it, there, know, there does. There seems to be this major disconnect. You know, you know. Look, church and nice. Here's here's a rule you need to understand. You know, the game has changed. You don't get to issue edicts from on high and smother groups of people. This technology right here has done an end run around you. You think you're going to sit here and abuse this priest, this priest who is a faithful, solid. Catholic priest, you think you're going to be able to use your old game, your old rules? Game's changed, guys. Tell us a little bit about Father Wiley, Paul. Um, well, I, uh, I've i been uh, attending the Mass at Holy Innocence for about five years, and I've had the privilege of actually serving Mass with Father Wiley. You know, sometimes you go to Mass and, uh, you know, you listen to the homily, or at least I listen to the homily, and I go out thinking, you know, why didn't I just take out a subscription to the New York Times, you know, <laughs> um, instead of putting money in the in the donation plate to listen to secular to secular dogmas, you know. However, when I listen to Father Wiley, I really feel that he is bolstering my faith. He is telling us that the faith has a solid intellectual basis in line with Pope Benedict's teachings on faith and reason. So I come out of uh, Holy Innocence after having attended uh, Mass and having listened to Father Wiley with a stronger faith and a stronger conviction that whatever the hierarchy tries to do to Father Wiley, they will not be victorious. You know, they can persecute one man, but what they've done, in fact, is given us, you know, they've created a hero figure you know, for thousands of people who who admire him and uh, agree with what he's, you know, what he says. And I really wonder, you know, is the director of communications not back from spring break, you know? Do they not have <laughs> internet access in the archdiocesan offices? You know, they've clearly demonstrated, they've clearly demonstrated 
demonstrated over the years that they can't run a church. Otherwise, they wouldn't be closing dozens of them in Manhattan alone. Yeah, yeah dozens. And, and let's, not, let's not forget, that's on top of what was it, 27 closings just two or three years ago. I mean, if you go the last 10 years, they have shut down or will have shut down. Probably the number isn't definitively set yet, at least been released. But you're talking about in the last 10 years, 100 parishes in the Archdiocese of Detroit. That is major, major contraction. And so what does this talk to? This talks to the incompetence of these people. And now they even screw up at what they've been practicing for decades, and that's silencing good priests who, who have the courage to teach the truths of our Catholic faith. Are you at, at all troubled, Paul? I think I know the answer to this. This is what we call in the business a softball question. <laughs> Paul, are you troubled at all that holy innocence would be uh, you know, at the top or near the top of this parish hit list while a parish like St. Francis Xavier that, that is notorious. You cannot be a Catholic in Manhattan and not know about the whole pro-gay agenda of, of, uh, of St. Francis Xavier Church there on 31st Street. I mean, it's ridiculous. Do, but are you troubled by that? I'm, I'm immensely troubled at the idea that um, people who are priests, bishops, archbishops, whatever, can close down a church that is providing spiritual succor to hundreds and thousands of people. I won't comment on other churches because I, I, I only go to Holy Innocence. I go there as often as I can th uh, during the week to the 6 p.m. traditional mass if my work schedule allows me, and I go there on Sundays at 10.30 where I have the honor of, of serving mass. So I'm troubled, and I'm also troubled really for the souls of the people who are making these decisions because at the end of the day, they'll have to answer for that decision. When, when Pope Benedict released the, uh, his motu proprio, uh, uh, you know, revivifying the Latin Mass around the world, uh, a number of uh, bishops went on record, a number of uh, luminaries at the Vatican went on record and said they were shocked at the resistance of the bishops around the world, the Western world, to want to even consider uh, uh, you know, welcoming uh, and being gregarious towards the uh, towards the Latin Mass, they couldn't believe it. And the more and more you talk to bishops and and uh, and you know chancery types, chancery rats, the more you talk to them, the more you see this massive resistance to anything that speaks of tradition. Now you can get down into the nitty gritty of a textbook or something, and people have to go hunting for it. But you bring out a Latin mass, you know, I said ad orientum, of course, and people are kneeling to receive Holy Communion on the tongue, and this is an anathema to the Church of Nice. Why does the establishment church of the today have such a feeling of animosity toward? anything that speaks of tradition, and certainly the, the Latin Mass, the traditional Latin Mass, because it's right there in front of your face. Why are they so, you know, why is this bee in their bonnet? Um, I, obviously, you should ask them. Um, frankly, I feel sorry for them. I know what the Lat traditional Latin Mass brings to me in terms of uh, spiritual nourishment. Um, it's quite unfortunate. And um, I think actually the results are quite clear in terms of the effect that this has. You spoke yourself about the massive reduction in church attendance. Now, is it not strange that for 1500 years we were celebrating the traditional Latin mass and hundreds of churches were built in the, in the 19th century um, by the same architect who built Holy Innocence and those churches were filled. Now we've been experimenting with a new liturgy over the last 50 years. You do not have to be a rocket scientist <laughs> to draw some conclusions. You know, if, if they were managing the Yankees, you know, and they, they, they brought on a, a, a trainer who was not capable of winning games, they'd, tr they'd, they'd throw out the trainer and they'd rethink the, their batting strategy. Well, they'd have I riots in the Bronx. <laughs> maybe the hierarchy, maybe the hierarchy of the Catholic Church should uh, review also its strategy. Yeah, it is. It's it's it, it's beyond disturbing. You know, we've reported on these things for a number of years. Many other people have reported many more years uh, than we have on it. We have the advantage of having you know television, so it's sometimes in this day and age, it's better form of communication, getting the message across. But the idea that there is just this. Th this, this radical brand. animosity towards anything of tradition, uh, uh, you know, even even a, <laughs> I, I mean, all of this stuff came out. Uh, you know, Cardinal Dolan went to uh, uh, Saint Francis Xavier Parish three years ago 
The Parish videotaped the event. It was the, uh, they just spent $10 million fixing it all up. Uh, and they invited him to come say the Mass. He's at the Mass. Many of our viewers may not remember this or may not know it, but he goes to the Mass, and at the Mass, uh, in the middle of Mass, they start bringing up all the different parish groups, you know, the Alcoholics Anonymous and this and that. And those are all fine works. You know, and all this stuff. You know, it's, you know, people need help, and that's wonderful. Uh, then they brought up and introduced to him the LGBT group and said the parish lesbian and gay group. And they brought him up, and he sat there in the chair. He had his glasses in his hand like this. He was slouched over. We got the video. He leans over. They make the announcement, and he goes like this. Goes like that, gives them the big handshake, big chair. Return to the sacraments and find an adult place in the church of their youth. I invite them and all those who support this ministry to stand. Can you imagine St. Athanasius, <laughs> Bishop Sheen, who's buried under the cathedral, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, standing there and giving a little cheer? to people who have perverted sex and are placing their immortal souls in danger? In, in, in danger? It's mind-boggling how far off the tracks the, 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 the Church of Nice, the establishment church, has gone. It's beyond the pale. Absolutely. And, um, you know, this, this entire incompetence and, and irresponsibility, you know, it wouldn't be so perilous, uh, you know, for, for souls, except for the fact that we're living in this, as you say, this toxic environment. You know, there are almost as many abortions in the city of New York as there are live births. We're witnessing state-sponsored attack on the family and the federal government trying to get involved in all aspects of our personal lives, including, you know, the education of, of our children. Where is the church? Where is the hierarchy? They're missing in action. No, Paul, they're missing no, no, in no, action. Paul, they're not missing in action at all. You know, we've got to pass immigration reform. It is the most pressing issue. We have got to pass immigration reform. We've got to make sure that health care is right in place. You know, these are important issues. I'm a European, so I can't, can't, I can't comment on, uh, <laughs> on immigration reform. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, we're out of time, but I wanted to say thank you very much for being on. Thank you for giving us the update. Could, Please. could, we end, could I end with, a, with a, a prayer that we're reciting every evening? You should know your listeners may be interested in this. You go right you ahead. Know, every, every, every evening after the 6 p.m. Mass in Holy Innocence, we uh, are praying that the, um, that the Archdiocese does not close down our church. And it's a prayer to uh, St. Michael. Now, those listeners who went to Catholic school might have to Google that. I said, St. Michael the Archangel. And the prayer goes as follows. O glorious Prince of the Heavenly Host, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. These crafty enemies of mankind have filled to overflowing with gall and wormwood the church, which is the bride of the spotless lamb. They have lain profane hands upon her most sacred treasures. Make haste, therefore, O invincible Prince, to help the people of God against the inroads of the lost spirits and grant us victory. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Paul, for being with us. We will keep, Pleasure. We will keep you and all the parishioners uh, in our prayers here and ask our viewers to do the same. Please extend our hellos to, uh, to Father Wiley and to uh, anybody there at Holy Innocence who uh, uh, needs to hear that there's people on their side and we're trying to spread the word. I should certainly do that, and thank you very much indeed for all your support. Thank you very much, Paul. God bless. Now, you'll have to talk to you folks about this for just a moment before we go to our next guest. You know, Catholic establishment media. This is this story is all over the internet. But when you listen to the Catholic establishment media, what do you suppose you hear? Nothing. You hear nothing. What did you hear when you uh, when Cardinal Dolan uh, called out Vice President Joe Biden at Palm Sunday Mass last year? And told the whole cathedral from the in the in his homily, told the whole cathedral, turn around, look at him, oh wave, hi, hi, hi. What do you hear from the Catholic establishment media about that? What do you hear from the Catholic establishment media when we talk about uh, uh, Obama 
coming to the Al Smith dinner at the invite and the behest of Cardinal Dolan. What do you hear from them? The Catholic establishment media, folks, is not where you need to go to get your information on what's going on in the church. They are too bound up with all the powers that be. Do not go there. Get rid of the Church of Nice from your subscriptions. Get rid of them from your email addresses. Get rid of them from everything. That is a vehicle for the destruction of the faith. So, now, speaking of more destruction of the faith, but in a different way, uh, we're going to go to our next guest here, Theodore Schobot. Theodore Schobot from rescuechristians.org. Hello, Theodore. How are you? Good to be on again, sir. How are you? Doing very well. Thank you very much. Do you think there is a—Theodore, uh, uh, by the way, is uh, uh, one of these guys who does a lot of battling for the faith in the Middle East, uh, taking care of uh, trying to help Catholics and uh, various other people uh, escape the, uh, the terrors of the religion of peace, otherwise known as Islam. Theodore, do you have a—you uh, uh, have a— Catholics are sick and tired of it. And they're not going to take it anymore. Story for us, don't you? Yes. Well, please share. Yes, it with I us. do. Well, in fact, um, in Central Africa, a, a group of Muslim militants uh, barged into a church called the Church of Fatima, and in the middle of mass, just opened fire on people, um, and they killed about thirty-one people, including the priest who was conducting the mass. This was a major massacre that took place. Uh, over thirty Catholics butchered in a matter of less than an hour. And so you have the, um, the Catholic youths in the church are so upset that they f barge out of the church, begin to make barricades of burning tires, went into a mosque and sacked the whole mosque. Now, no Muslim died because there was no Muslims in the mosque. But nonetheless, they were making a statement. Now, fast forward just uh, a few days afterwards, in around June 4th, you had a group of Nigerian Christians who also, I mean, the biggest place of persecution of Christians right now is Nigeria. Thousands of Christians have been killed by a Muslim group in Nigeria called Boko Haram. And so the Boko Haram uh, went into a church. They killed nine Christians. So the men in the church got their guns, went after the guys who opened fire on the church, and killed four of the militants, and the rest of them escaped. Then, about a day after, uh, there was a very large battle between Christians and Muslims, and 37 uh, jihadists were killed in the battle, and it was a victory for the Christians. So right now, we are seeing in Nigeria, not just in Nigeria, but in Syria, in Iraq, and in other places, uh, a rise of, of Christians who are really, they had enough with the Muslim persecution and have decided to defend themselves. So various uh, Christian militias have increased over just this month. Uh, and there's a lot, of, and I believe that uh, eventually this is going to lead to some sort of a civil war in Nigeria. Yeah, we were, uh, our uh, uh, chief editor here, Charlie Hornbacher, and I were in Nigeria three years ago, I think it was three and a half years ago, and we had the a very unfortunate experience of going to a, uh, a church uh, uh, in uh, near Abuja, the capital, uh, yes. that had been uh, car bombed, suicide bombed, homicide bombed uh, mm -hmm. by a member of Boko Haram. And uh, mm -hmm. I think I, I forget the number. I think it was 41 people were killed. 28 mm -hmm. of them were parishioners. Many of them were children. <laughs> And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, we made an appeal actually online to help uh, raise money for yes. them, and many people responded generously. But, uh, yes. yeah, it, if for people who don't know specifically about Nigeria, it really is kind of, you know, if you were to think of it in terms of a shape, it's sent essentially a square uh, mm -hmm. where the what would be the northeast half uh, is very Muslim, and the southern mm -hmm. part is uh, very uh, is, is Christian, about half-half Protestant and Catholic. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the southern part is the uh, richer part, uh, the more wealthy mm -hmm. part because of the oil and all of that. And uh, Boko Haram uh, has been, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a hit and run terrorist organization. Yes. I mean, well, it's the worst. T tell tell yeah. us, because, you know, we're not, nobody's hearing this in the secular media. You're not really hearing much of it in, in some corners, Catholic establishment media, pay attention. Um, uh, not hearing it in some corners of the uh, Catholic media uh, either. What, Tell us, just run down a list of, say, in the last month, things that Muslim 
uh, adherents have done to various Christian Catholic groups? Well, I mean, if you look at what happened after the battle, Boko Haram was they were so upset because they lost this battle, and so they went out and they just started killing random people, and they ended up slaughtering four hundred people after the battle. So it had a huge, uh, there was a huge slaughter that took place. Um, and if you look at what's happening in Afghanistan, actually, not just in Afghanistan, um, uh, in, in Pakistan as well, uh, you have uh, over 700 Christian girls that are kidnapped every single year. And this is a, came out of a recent report. And, uh, and also, they, um, if you look at uh, a lot of the massacres that take place in Nigeria, you had 31 people killed just recently. And numerous other massacres. But I just want to make something very clear that believe it or not, when we reported this story of the militias, they were Christians who came out and said that we were wrong for writing these things. And I, I and people said that it was unbiblical. It's unbiblical to defend yourself. It's like extreme pacifism. And all I have to do is look to the first commandment of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, love the Lord all your heart, your spirit, your mind, your soul, and your strength. So there is a physical element involved. And when you look into the Old Testament, uh, God praises King Hosea for cleansing the temple of the corrupt priest. And he says, Hosea loved the Lord with all of his mind, his heart, his soul, and his strength. So that verse, when Jesus says the first of all commandments, that verse can be applied to self-defense. It can be applied to militancy really christian militias ma making christian militias um and it's very sad to see like you said uh the catholic establishment because i've seen the catholic church many people in the catholic church cow down to islam not just cow down to islam but the homosexual agenda as well all enemies of catholicism yeah it's an ad it's, and, a, it's an attitude really it's this it's this uh uh, uh approach to the world that the world uh, the, the dangers and the evils in the world can be reasoned with. That you can yes. sit down and have a dialogue with them. Uh, I don't know if I don't know what many people in the church think the point of the dialogue is. It seems many people think the point of the dialogue yeah. is just to have another dialogue. But Theodore, thank you well, very you very it's much. Cost peace. All right. Thank you very God much for you, for joining us. To give it, you got twenty seconds. Tell us about uh, rescuechristians.org. Go to rescuechristians.org. Pay how, however much money you want. And it goes directly to saving Christian lives, delivering them out of Islamic persecution into safer countries. RescueChristians.org. RescueChristians.org. Got it very much. Theodore, thank you very much for being God with us again. Sir. We'll have you on the show soon. Thanks very much. All right, you folks, too. when we come back talking about the destruction of the faith, we're going to get into the whole Common Core uh, curriculum controversy, uh, this time in uh, the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, but also in some other places in Wisconsin, Wisconsin of all places. Just stick with us. I mean, the, the news is coming at us fast and furious, and we're bringing it right back to you. Stay with us. Go out and baptize all nations. These words from our Lord are a command, not a suggestion. We must call the whole world to Christ. We must teach the world about Christ. We must love the world closer to Christ. We must go out to all nations on this earth and bring them into his one holy Catholic and apostolic church. As the late and great Jesuit Father John Harden reminds us, any Catholic who is not about the business of evangelization might never entertain a serious hope of the beatific vision. Get your churchmilitant.tv premium account today so you can learn the sacred art of evangelization with our latest show, Baptize All Nations. Sign up today. Hi, I'm Michael Miller. Welcome to this first episode of Baptize All Nations. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to this week's edition of Miked Up. Now, a controversy is erupting. Of course, it's a controversy, and of course, it's erupting because it has to do with Planned Parenthood, hundreds of millions of tax dollars, and the lies, of course, about sex education and abortion and all of those things. Joining us live right now is Lila Rose from Live Action. Hello, Lila. How are you? Hi, Michael. Good. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. I'm just going to let you dive right into this. You guys, once again, with your excellent work, went undercover into uh, uh, various Planned Parenthood operations and have, once again, to no one's surprise, uncovered horrible stuff. What, what, what do you know? 
Sure. Let me start with the big picture. These tapes are just a demonstration of a problem that's already actually been public for years. And that's Planned Parenthood's sexual agenda and ideology for kids. You can access it actually online on some of their websites, some of their YouTube channels where they're promoting things like torture sex, which is bondage sadomasochism for teenagers, where they're marketing sexual experimentation and dangerous sexual practices to kids and saying, well, as long as it feels like something you want to try, and as long as you're using a condom, then it's okay. I mean, completely uh, misinformation for teens, setting them up for very difficult things down the road. I mean, health issues where obviously there's the morality, there's no morality in their, their so-called sex education. It's all about uh, what you may feel like doing or whatever addiction you get yourself into. But our tapes, to zero in on those, show this in a more direct manner. And we have actors posing as 15-year-old girls sitting down with Planned Parenthood so-called health counselors saying, hey, you know, my boyfriend wants to try some stuff. What should we do? Well, and the well, plan let me stop you right there because show the audience one of these uh, one takes we have about a minute long clip of one of them and uh, uh, it's it's quite revealing you know we have a little saying around here look if a, if, if a company will kill children there's nothing else it won't do exactts <laughs> so true this and, shouldn't and be warning, a shock. Viewer, viewer discretion advised these tapes are very explicit thank you very much for the warning go ahead and roll the tape guys in a new undercover investigation, live action discovers just how far Planned Parenthood will go in pursuit of its dangerous sexual ideology. You look like you're how old? Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. Have you guys ever gone to a sex shop together? Mm -hmm. People have different types of fetishes. Kinky, so. sex, dominatrix stuff. It's uh -huh. very popular. The dominatrix. Okay. Some people uh, like pain with sex. With the handcuffs in the room. Really? Just using toys, handcuffs. Some whipping or, you know, some oh. asphyxiation. Some people like being spanked or hit. Oh, really? Or whipped. You can gag them with them. They're spanked with the whip, welts across the back. There may be some blood. Patients will sometimes come in with rope burns or um, markings on their breasts from like clamps. Oh, okay. And okay. Again, it's consensual. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's okay. Bondage type thing. If you're gagged or something, you, you know, you're tied to a bed or tied to a tree. Or it just depends what type of pain you can take. It's totally okay. okay. It'll feel good to you. Lila, <laughs> there is no way anybody who is not evil can't hear that and recognize evil. That is disgusting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's so um, disgusting. It's difficult to believe. Michael, I was meeting with a liberal reporter of a big new newspaper in D.C. last week to talk about these materials ahead of time, and, and her jaw dropped, and she looked at me, and she said, I find this very hard to believe. And of course, it's because she goes to bat for Planned Parenthood right and left, and she didn't want to believe that Planned Parenthood is pushing torture sex on teenagers, but that's exactly what's happening. And that's why it's important to get these tapes in front of people, and if you're a parent, and you're listening in or a taxpayer or if you even just care about teenagers in your community, you can take action. Um, people of faith, it's our job to take action. And what I think we need to be doing at the local level is making sure that Planned Parenthood is not in our school systems. We can lobby our school boards. We can call the superintendent. We can write letters to the editor. We can just be that, uh, you know, that glue that just keeps sticking that won't go away saying, hey, we will not, we do not want Planned Parenthood or this crazy so-called sex education in our schools because it's harmful, it's immoral, it's wrong, it's dangerous, and we should have a say. And I just hope that we can take more action at the community level and take responsibility for what's happening to our teenagers in our communities. Let me ask you, do you think that, yeah, I mean, there's an awful lot of discussion about defunding Planned Parenthood, as in Nebraska, I think, just did, the, or Kansas, Nebraska, which I can't remember which one. Uh, this whole question is up in Louisiana. Do you think that these sorts of things getting out are a catalyst to have people go, whoa? Oh, Absolutely. I mean, it's, it brings a lot of shock and, and uproar, which is important to get people thinking because otherwise it's just flying under the radar. You can't fight evil if you don't know where the evil is or what it's doing. But once it's exposed, then you know what you're, what's in front of you and you can overcome it. And that's the, important of these, the importance of these tapes, the importance of live actions campaigns at PlannedParentedExposed.com, the whole body of research, why it's so crucial. We spent the last couple of weeks putting all 
all this evidence on Capitol Hill in front of every legislator on both sides of the aisle, sending it out to state state lawmakers. We're going to be sending it out to superintendents across the country saying, look, here are the facts. Here's the information. Now make a, make a good decision for your community. And I think it's clear what that decision is. No more Planned Parenthood. They can't be trusted. It's an abusive, violent, uh, evil organization that's killing hundreds of thousands of children a year and hurting hundreds of thousands of more who are born. we got less than a minute left. Let me ask you, what kind of reaction do you get from the party of death, national lawmakers mm -hmm. in Congress, senator and congressman, uh, when, uh, when they see this? Do they even respond yeah. to you? Well, they, a lot of them they were they helped get a, they were helped to get elected by Planned Parenthood, so there's sure. deeply entrenched interests. But we got to pray for them and keep working at it. We can change hearts and minds. God's all powerful; He can help pierce a heart, change a mind. So we got to keep at it and keep spreading the truth wherever we go. Is it? Uh, how about on the Republican side? You know, there's a big. Uh, Big debate about the heart and soul of the GOP. Leadership, yeah. national leadership wants to avoid these things, doesn't it? Yeah, we can't we can't be silent and we can't be, you know, sit sit that idle. We have to stand up and fight for the heart of the Republican Party to say if you really care about human rights and you really care about democracy, then you should first of all be protecting the most the most fundamental human right, life, the life of the child in the womb. And then you need to be fighting these incredible extreme leftist agenda to push deviant, dangerous sexuality on our kids. And this needs to be a leading issue, and it's not talked about enough, which is why we're doing this campaign. Excellent. Lila Rose from Live Action, thank you very much for joining us. We have all of your information link on link there on the page. Pray and pray for us. The, we need prayers. And ditto <laughs> back right at you. Thank you very much, Lila, for joining us. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. All right, everybody, we'll be right back with more uh, just controversy after controversy. It's can't, unbelievable, the stuff that's coming in. Please stick around. We'll be right back. Hello, we're coming to you from Australia. And we want you to become premium members on churchmilitant.tv. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, we're coming to you from Australia. And we want you to become premium members on churchmilitant.tv. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So sign up. Hello, we're coming to you from Australia. And we want you to become premium members on churchmilitant.tv. Okay, so sign up today. Woo! Yes! <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It's a great trip from Australia. Some wonderful thoughts there from Albury in the uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful country of Australia. Now, we talked about uh, some of the demolition of the church that's going on and something we have gotten a, a, a flood might be overstating it, but very, very many calls, emails, uh, letters, uh, uh, sort of with faithful Catholics all over the United States at their wits' end about the Common Core curriculum uh, being imposed uh, on, the, well, it's public schools everywhere have accepted it, but now the sort of capitulation to this on the part of Catholic schools. And standing by with us now, we have uh, Steve Becker and Abby Fiji, and they're coming to us from the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, where they have a number of concerns about how uh, Archbishop Listecki is just kind of you know, uh, how should you say, throwing in the towel and not putting up much of a fight and kind of sidestepping the issue about, you know, the dangers of Common Core. Now, we've got to say, first of all, welcome to both of you. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Do you first of all, what do you think is going on here with Common Core in general? Before we look at it in the context of, you know, coming into Catholic schools, what is Common Core? Well, it, it seems to me that it's an educational trend that uh, people are jumping on the bandwagon with. And obviously the states, you know, had uh, some incentive to do so to get federal money. Um, the diocese, you know, it, it seems like they're split, half are adopting it and half uh, are not. Th those that have adopted it, um, my only speculation is that they, uh, they're they jumping on board because it's the latest educational trend and um, they, they like to follow those trends. Uh, do, you do you think, Abby, that there is a, well, a danger to the faith here uh, in, in Common Core, when Common Core comes into the schools and just becomes kind of the standard thing, is there a danger to the faith, to the faith being even further watered down, if that's even possible now? Absolutely. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops just said that it was created for public school children. And we believe that a thread of Catholicism should be woven through every class that our children take. And that is absolutely removed under this 
um, common core system. Why do so you I go ahead. I believe absolutely it will water down our faith even further. Why do you think every time, I mean, there are thousands of Catholics all over the country, thousands is an understatement, who every single time they try to challenge this issue and bring it before the bishops and bring it before, they just run into this stone wall. It's just, that's it. They, you know, this is the way it is. It's, uh, uh, there is no, you know, this is, it's just sort of this mandate comes down from on high that we're just going to be doing this. What, why do you think there is such this willingness to uh, accept and embrace this? against the wishes of the very parents of the students who have to sit in these classes. You know, it's really a mystery to us uh, because that's been exactly our experience here is we've uh, tried to raise these concerns to the archdiocese. Um, we, we tried to get a uh, meeting with, with, with the archbishop um, and his office was not interested in meeting with us. Uh, we tried to meet with the superintendent and she said she had time, you know, a few months out on her schedule to meet with us. <laughs> Um, this is a, this is an important issue, and we're sort of at a loss as to why they, the archdiocese wouldn't at least meet with us and uh, and hear what we have to say. So, well, let me ask you this: that there is, uh, you are both aware, maybe some of our viewers are not, uh, that a distinguished, I mean, a very distinguished list of Catholic scholars, uh, academics, uh, headed by uh, Jerry Bradley at the University of Notre Dame Law School. Uh, uh, you know, put together a, a, a letter, a four-page summary, really, that they sent to the bishops and the USCCB and everything else saying, in short, I mean, if I'll summarize it, it's a little bit more academic sounding than this, but uh, run away from Common Core, don't have anything to do with it. 132, I think it was, signatories on that letter, some of the most prestigious names in the Catholic academic world, and yet it's like they may as well not even wasted their time writing the letter. What's going on? Yeah, well, you know, I don't know. The archdiocese here has sort of told us uh, something similar that uh, you know the parents should uh, should rely on our academic experts to make the decision as to what's best for the, the curriculum for our students. Um, and uh, in our counter, is many many academic experts have just made that decision. Uh, as you know, here in Wisconsin, four of the dioceses have rejected. Four out of the five dioceses in our state have rejected the Common Core. Um, you know, one of the bishop in, in Green Bay has said that uh, he understands it's experimental. Uh, we don't have any results yet. We're going to take a wait and see approach. So we have a lot of experts that wait that have weighed in uh, on our side. It's not just parents um, talking. Uh, it's, it's also parents and experts. I, I, I want to I want to give you some information. We uh, d we did some research today and called a number of the other dioceses in Wisconsin. We're actually kind of surprised uh, that that information you just gave, Steve, might need to have a little updating. They're actually. Uh, the Diocese of uh, Superior and the Diocese of Madison both said, uh, you know, they have these uh, FAQs, you know, frequently asked questions on their site. They just said, uh, well, yeah, you know, we, you know, we've accepted this, or, you know, the textbooks are mandated by the state, so we don't have a choice, and they're not as, uh, they're not as off board on this as, as it might be. You might want to give a check with them yourselves. We talked to the communications lady in uh, uh, Madison, and uh, she said, no, well, it was just kind of that, that wimpy, you know, well, you know, we can't really do anything about it, you know, it's just the state, that's the way it is. But what I want to ask you is that the, um, uh, there in, uh, in Milwaukee, um, uh, Archbishop uh, Jerome Mostecki uh, uh, has said that using, this is a quote from, the, from their press release, from the Milwaukee Archdiocese press release, quote, using them, the Common Core Standards, will do nothing to change the curriculum, reading material, or content. Let me quote that again. From the Archbishop, using them, the Common Core Standards, will do nothing to change the curriculum, the reading material, or the content. Uh, you guys beg to differ, don't you, Abby? Yes, our books say Common Core on the cover. Our children are doing new math. Um, it's already changing the content. We, Our school is only so far had the math book implemented, but we've seen a drastic change in the way they're teaching our children math. Let's talk about this math thing, this, uh, the one thing we have this like three times three, uh, sort of the, the, the common core way of doing math versus the old way of doing math from everything, from how the textbooks are written, to who reviews them, to what the examples and the content are. This is a, you know, I think what people need to realize is this entire common core thing came about because Bill Gates, 
uh, uh, approached Obama and said, here, I'm going to cough up the first, you know, whatever it is, 20 million, 40 million, whatever it is, dollars to get the ball rolling on this. And of course, Obama's like, oh, yeah, I'm all I'm all down with that. So, you know, once again, you dig a little, scratch a little, get just below the surface. And what do you see? You see bishops, knowingly or unknowingly, in bed with the Democratic Party agenda. So, when Archbishop Listecki says using these Common Core standards, oh, you know nothing's going to change. You know nothing will change in the curriculum, the textbooks, the material. I mean, you guys have the textbooks right there. They have Common Core stamped on them. The old books were thrown out. You tell me when I'm wrong. The old books were thrown out, and the new Common Core stamped, signed, sealed, delivered, signed by the devil, are sitting right there in front of you and in front of your students in the classrooms. Right. Uh, right. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, I have a third grader and a fifth grader, and their books say Common Core in them. They bring home questions uh, under certain categories that uh, are foreign uh, to me, that sort of the method for uh, answering them or for, you know, what, what the uh, the teaching point is. I'm not really sure. Some of them, to me, are more like brain teasers, you know, for a 41-year-old than they are for, uh, you know, a, a teaching lesson for uh, for a third grader. Uh, I, I think I think a lot of these questions are... Are, are developmentally inappropriate. And again, I'm not an academic expert, but uh, I just wonder if it's been adequately checked and vetted by anybody to see whether a third grader should be able to understand these questions or even answer them. G give us an example. You guys have a number of examples. Give our viewers just one example here, this three times three business and square root of nine and all that, uh, of, of, of what the difference is between the old way it was and the way Common Core presents it. Sure. Well, you know, there's uh, one of the issues that, that Common Core is presenting is, is the use of uh, boxes, lines, and dots in order to group numbers together and then make your addition or subtraction using these boxes and lines. So the, so the student is supposed to use this as another possible way of understanding how to do a simple addition problem. Um, a lot of parents find it very confusing. Um, they use terms like tens, partners, and this sort of thing, uh, which I'm not still sure I still don't fully understand. Um, uh, but you know, the, the old way works worked pretty well um, for teaching math for a very long time. And um, I'm not sure why we need to experiment uh, with these new methods on everybody all at the same time. And of course, the concern, Abby, is is I mean, you know, follow me through here if I'm wrong. I mean, you know, what is teaching multiplication tables a different way got to do with destroying the faith? Because all of this initial material is the camel's nose under the tent. What right. is waiting in the wings in the right. health classes and right. the social classes is the whole Planned Parenthood agenda and all of that. And the concern here, right, tell me if I'm wrong again, is that uh, once the bishops have acquiesced, and what is it, 100 dioceses? There's only 200 in the country, 194. A uh, 100 of them have already in some form or manner already accepted this and have implemented it in whatever way. But the problem is, uh, uh, the, the problem is that you know, you're not going to be able to stop the steamroller from going once, once, once it goes. Right, right. And we have over a thousand signatures of parents who are concerned in our diocese saying, please don't do this. And he's dismissing us. He continues to dismiss us. What kind of response do you get when you, have you actually spoken to anyone at the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, either on the phone, I mean, of, of a human communication besides electronic? Yes, I did have a, a phone conference uh, with uh, the superintendent, uh, Kathleen Sapelka, a few months ago. Um, I had called to arrange a meeting with the bishop uh, and uh, was told the, that you know, that would take months and months and a formal request and this sort of thing, but I could talk to the superintendent. So I caught her in the office. And uh, so we had a very good discussion um, about it. Uh, lasted over an hour, as I recall. Um, you know, what, what, I, what I gleaned from that was that they have a very... Um, a distorted view of, of who we are and what we're up to. You know, they, they think that we don't want any change at all. We don't want to try anything new in education. Uh, they think that, uh, you know, we're, we're afraid of these standards. We think, they think that we don't respect our, our own archbishop or, or her own, uh, you know, decisions and judgment and that sort of thing. So I, I, we are, I was able to clear up a lot of those uh, issues with her, I think, during that call, that we are people that love our church. We love our, our schools. Uh, that's why we're, we're hanging around and trying to do something about it, right? Some of us, are, you know, so... Um, uh, I also gleaned from that conversation that it was uh, that she was trying to embrace an educational trend, that that was the primary reason for going forward with this. Do you think that there is, just last question, we're running out of time here, but uh, do you think that you are being dealt with uh, in good faith? Abby? 
Um, we don't want to disparage our leadership, but uh, parents are writing letters of concern and getting a form letter back. And we were just basically told, we were sent a letter that was uh, not kind saying, you know, who are you to question our academic ex experts? It's ridiculous to think that parents know better than our experts and things of that nature. Well, so, as, as we said before, you know, uh, Jerry Bradley at Notre Dame and 131 other actual experts <laughs> uh, who could probably blow away the uh, uh, the experts they're talking about said, run like mad from this. It is a, uh, uh, you know, I just want to give you an encouragement here from Church Milton headquarters, churchmilton.tv headquarters. Church Milton headquarters is in Rome. <laughs> but uh, we just want to say, you know, God bless you. You guys keep up the fight. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Keep us posted on what's going on. And, uh, you know, you'll get the link, the show will over, send it to everybody. And, uh, you know, let's get the ball rolling on us. Catholic uprising, right? Catholic Uprising. That's right. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, Abby. God bless. When we come back, folks, we're going to be talking about another area that needs Catholic Uprising. Boy, oh boy, does it. The next scandal at the University of Notre Dame. We'll be right back. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Voris. Have you ever wondered why the Blessed Sacrament is not as distributed on the tongue as much as it once was? Do you wish there was something you could do about it? Father John Harden, a Jesuit who died about 15 years ago, once said, whatever you can do to stop communion in the hand will be blessed by God. This new premium show, Sleight of Hand, Reception Deception, will give you the knowledge to combat the abuse of communion in the hand. And in this episode, you'll learn how all the popes have been against this practice from its beginning. Take a sneak peek here at some of the footage from our next episode of Sleight of Hand, Reception Deception. Not surprised many to see the Holy Father distributing the sacred body of our blessed Lord onto the tongue of kneeling communicants who have come to Him to receive Christ, but rare and wonderful indeed were the scenes of these brave and pious priests who protected their vulnerable Eucharistic Lord from possibly being profaned by common handling or even the loss of sacred particles. At both papal masses were seen these priests redirecting, instructing communicants who had put out their hand to receive our Lord to instead receive on their tongue in order to reverently and securely receive their God. This would be considered a major pastoral taboo by many church leaders in America, and yet that is exactly, precisely, what is being done in Rome. To watch the full episode in this series, be sure to sign up for a premium account with churchmilitant.tv. The link to do that is just outside this screen here. With a premium account, you'll have full access to all of our content, giving you the knowledge to combat not only this abuse, but many others found in the church today as well. Churchmilitant.tv will help train you to use the weapons of philosophy, theology, apologetics, so that you can become an effective member of the Church Militant here on Earth. God love you. I'm Michael Voris. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to churchmilitant.tv's Miked Up show, our weekly show. Uh, well, more scandals at Notre Dame as uh, continues. Uh, I, as many of you know, I'm a graduate class of 1983, and uh, I wish I'd had known then what I know now. Perhaps I'd uh, uh, been a little bit more militant then, but as it was, it was just football games and parties for the most part. But uh, uh, there's much more on campus going on these days than just football games and parties, trust me. Uh, our guest standing by right now with us, William Dempsey. Hello, William. How are you? Thank you very much for being on. Hi, Michael. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. William is, uh, is the, uh, uh, the top dog at the Sycamore uh, Trust, which is uh, a group of uh, uh, very concerned alumni uh, at Notre Dame, very concerned about the direction in which the university has been heading meaning away from Catholicism and an embrace of secularism and the agenda of everything that goes on there. Uh, you know, the homosexuality, Planned Parenthood, uh, one thing after another. Uh, so, uh, William, let me ask you there, <laughs> you, you lose track. I mean, if you, you know, you need four hands to keep track of on your fingers of every single, uh, every single scandal that goes on. What's the latest thing here now at Notre Dame? Well, there have been several, uh, Michael, but, you know, let me say at the outset that, you know, I find myself uh, usually uh, uh, pointing to the fault lines at the University of Notre Dame, uh, but I, I don't want to give the impression of doing that 
uh, that the place has really gone down the tubes altogether because it's really still, uh, I mean, it's a very precious place, as you know, you've been sure. there. And, uh, and the, there's much that is still Catholic about it. Um, there, there's a, you know, a solid uh, core, if a minority, uh, still of dedicated, wonderful Catholic scholars. And let me just put it this way. Um, you know, Professor Fred Ferdosi gave, I think, a really, really apt description of the school. Uh, and he's one of the oldest, uh, oldest professors, uh, serving professors there, and one of the best in the philosophy department. He called it something like a public school in a Catholic neighborhood. Yep. Yeah, I remember that. It was great books. Yeah, it is a great. Now, something like doesn't mean just like. Um, be, and I'll just you know summarize it this way: a, a, a dedicated Catholic uh, a young man or woman who goes to Notre Dame, uh, intending to get and wanting to get a good Catholic education, can get a terrific Catholic education. But the problem is that the Catholic representation on the faculty has declined so radically over the recent de decades that it takes that kind of dedication and, and careful selection to accomplish that. Otherwise, it's kind of a crapshoot. Yep. Uh, and so our pr primary focus is on this question of, of rebuilding um, the strength uh, and, and, uh, and representation of Catholic faculty. Now, let me go on then, because this, uh, the culture of the university and all the universities follows the culture of the faculty. And so we have these episodes that you're referring to now you know, we started nine years ago with the Vagina Monologues and the Queer Film Festival. Then we became very much aware of the root problem in the faculty. But since then, you know, as you know, we've had, uh, just to name uh, some of the more notorious examples, the honoring of, of President Obama, the most formidable opponent of the church on abortion and our religious liberty uh, that we've had uh, in, in recent years. And, and most recently, there's kind of been a perfect storm uh, in the last month or so, um, the uh, I'll just name two of them, with which I, I know you're familiar. One is the, you know, last year, um, uh, the president of the university, Father Jenkins, reversed 15 or more years of precedent and recognized officially a gay student organization. That was last year. Now, I think that's, <laughs> I won't talk about that or anything, but I think that uh, that my it was a serious error, but in any event, forget that for right now and go on to this year. Just about a month ago, the university denied recognition to a student organization that was formed in order to advance the church's position on gay marriage. So now, I mean, this is kind of a startling dichotomy. Uh, yeah, I don't, you may you may not know uh, you may not know William, but uh, Michael Bradley was uh, actually a guest on our show. I think it was two or three weeks ago, graduation weekend, uh, the, the next weekend, uh, actually talking about that very thing. So he's one of the students, very fine young man, uh, you know, behind the push to say, well, wait a second, if you're going to allow them, we'll allow us too. The university raises up the gay group and crushes down the Catholic group. <laughs> yeah, Michael, Michael, incidentally, uh, was one of our student honorees this year, just a week ago at the university when we had our annual breakfast. Um, and he's just terrific. I mean, he's a Irish rover. He's the son of Jerry Bradley, the professor at the law school. Right. Who was also a speaker at our conference. Now, uh, all right, that's the one thing. Now, most recently, and the thing that we're deeply concerned about right now, we're hoping that the, that the student organization matter may eventually be rectified. And we're hoping this one might too. The uh, fellows of the university hold the ultimate power at the university, authority, I should say. Um, six uh, priests, CSC priests, six lay people, all members of the board of trustees. They appoint the trustees. Now, they appointed a uh, young woman, um, Katie Washington, a, a valedictorian um, at the university recently, a recent graduate, who has taken a public stance in strong support of the Obamacare contraception abortifacient mandate that Notre Dame, of course, is suing to set aside in the courts. And in her, the statement that she joined, um, the uh, signatories at the Johns Hopkins Medical School, where she is now, uh, strongly 
oppose the assertions of religious liberty by the by the church and by these religious organizations. Now, you know, I mean, uh, really, I mean, uh, Apple wouldn't appoint to its board some somebody who had taken a public position in opposition to its claim, uh, patent claim against uh, uh, against Samsung. Uh, and here in Notre Dame, does something really worse because of the fact that it betokens to the public certainly, and I'm afraid to the courts, somewhat of, of a lack of dedication uh, to the conscience claim that they're asserting in that court. Now, I'm assuming and hoping that the fellows just didn't know about this at the time. Uh, and I, I don't know that one way or the other. But so we have a petition up there uh, and gaining a lot of strength. Uh, and I've written the fellows about it and asking them to somehow roll this back. And it, we're, this is no criticism of Ms. Washington. She's not Catholic. She's not obliged to take any position uh, uh, one way or the other on any of these matters. Perfectly free. She wasn't on the board at that time. So it's not a criticism of her. It's not saying anything about whether trustees can disagree with one another, even whether a trustee might uh, might not agree with every position of the church. It isn't that at all. It's this embrace uh, of someone who, who has taken a public uh, position against this important lawsuit involving this critical issue of religious liberty. So that's, that's we have that. Now let, those- let me, let me ask you this, Bill, if I can for a moment. If you, uh, uh, if we presume that at least some of the uh, fellows uh, appointing her uh, were aware of her public stance, which essentially sides her as a board of trustee against the very university that she's a board of trustee on. I mean, we continue to see these kind of oddities out of the administration. I'm sorry, the uh, uh, the, the fellows and the trustees at Notre Dame. These, you know, we had this example of the Planned Parenthood supporter who got named and then all of a sudden resigned. Was that two years ago, three years ago? Uh, it, it's it's just one thing. How come there's never a controversy about somebody being appointed who's a solid, faithful, traditional Catholic who wants to just promote the faith? There's never any controversy about that because there's never one ever appointed like that. Oh no, Michael! <laughs> Wait a minute! I don't know if that's true. I, you know, I I just wouldn't go that far. Uh, let me say first of all that you know there are 49 uh, people on that board of trustees, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and and we and we just don't know uh, all of them, and and. And I'm not prepared at all to say that uh, that any of them are not uh, dedicated to the mission of the university. But I think what you well, say they is set that the, they set I, the mission I, of the university, though, right? I mean, the mission's that's not an objective truth. It's what they say it is. I understand that, and and uh, you're suggesting, I'm sure, that we look at what they do in terms of judging, you know, how committed they are to the principles and teachings of the Catholic Church. And there we have what you've indicated. Two years ago, uh, and that was an instructive, uh, an instructive episode. Uh, we had uh, this uh, uh, woman from uh, from Chicago, um, a very successful businesswoman, who was appointed to the board, uh, and it turned out that she had been a longtime financial supporter, and not really a Planned Parenthood, but of the equivalent of Emily's List, mm -hmm. uh, which, as you know, is a single-purpose pro-abortion Democratic candidate. Uh, for election kind of an organization. All right, now, yeah, and, and you know, when you say, well, we assume that they didn't know, or maybe they didn't know, I, I, I'm doing that because I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt here, but let me say that in the case of Katie Washington, you go to Google and you plug in Katie Washington and then plug in contraception, and this, is, this comes up in 15 seconds, and if you just want to plug in Johns Hopkins, it'll come up. And and so, you know, you just have to assume there was no vetting at all, just not. All right, well, I'll assume that. But but I, you know, it is somewhat of a stretch. I would, let me put it this way. It's something like, what did St. Thomas say about uh, he'd rather believe something than uh, that a cow would fly out the window or something like that than someone would tell him a lie or whatever it was. Well, I would rather assume that there was no vetting than that they knew what they were doing and made this appointment nonetheless. But there it is, now they know it. And so the test is now, well, what will they do about it? And now this is the real test, and it's a test in particular of the Holy Cross priests that hold six of these 12 positions on the fellows.
It's a test of their commitment to the mission of the school. You'd think, you'd think the legal team at Notre Dame would, uh, would be pulling their hair, hair out over this one. It's very, very difficult to argue in front of the court that the university is against this when you're putting people on the board who are supported. <laughs> oh, Michael, I mean, you want to, you know, I'm a lawyer and I've got a lot of experience in litigation. And yeah, it's not just this. We have a district court judge here who has expressed skepticism about Notre Dame's sincerity. Well, why? Because they waited until the very last minute in order to sue. Besides that, in October, they sued in December. In October, the administration announced to the faculty that they were going to apply, uh, comply in 2014. Then we had the Bishop's Conference out in Baltimore. Father Jenkins went to the conference in Baltimore. They sued in December. All right. Now, all right, well, we can, you know, that can all be explained, but it does raise a need for some kind of explanation. Uh, and now we have, now we have this episode, and then we had Father Jenkins saying in a, an interview that uh, he didn't think that people ought to be scandalized by <laughs> the Notre Dame's compliance, because now they've complied. They are the only, the only plaintiff in all these lawsuits across the country who have lost so far in court. So they're without court protection and they've complied. All right. Now, Father Jenkins says, well, people shouldn't be scandalized because it is not Notre Dame that is supplying the contraceptives. It is the third party administrator. <laughs> that is perfectly true, but that's the government's argument. Yeah, that's the and, government's argument. You just made the case for them. The, the, now, the, the attorney for Obama can just sit down and have a cup of coffee at that point. <laughs> Again, I, I'm, kind, I, I, you know, if I'm a lawyer, I and uh, I, I, as a lawyer, I'm looking at it and I say, well, Ed, you know, this requires explanation. Now it can be explained, I think, but it's going to require explanation. And now here comes another one, and this is going to be very hard to explain. You put all those things together, and then you worry if you're a trial lawyer, what's going to happen when the fellows are put under cross examination or under deposition, and Father Jenkins is. And you, you know, and so if I'm the lawyer, I want to say I go to the fellows and I say, please don't make this tough for me, you know. Yeah, so, certainly. But Bill, but it's you know it's not over. Let let's see what they do. Let's now. let's let's see what happens. People can uh, we'll put your link up. People can go to the petition, read read more about it. Uh, uh, Bill Dempsey, ladies and gentlemen, William Dempsey. William, what what class are you? Fifty four. Fifty two. Fifty two. I'm eighty three. Yeah. So we're uh, uh, there. We are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for being on tonight, Bill. God bless you guys at Sycamore Trust. Uh, you know, keep up the fight. Let's, uh, you know, restore the faith to uh, the best degree you possibly can at yours and mine and many other people's alma mater. God bless, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Bye now. Thank you. All right, everybody. We just, uh, you know, keep all of this in your prayers, folks. Every time we turn around somewhere, it doesn't matter where it is. The church is just under attack. There's, there's missteps inside. There's, there's, you know, attacks from the outside. It's, it's things. Things are, things are near a desperate point, which is why we say we need to have a Catholic uprising. Things need to be restored. Things need to be brought into the public. And all of our guests tonight have done a fine job of that. We're going to sign out, of course, with our usual prayer, customary prayer to St. Michael. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us, sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God love you all. See you next week.